Since the Baltimore and Ohio began hauling flour from Ellicott's Mills, Maryland to Baltimore in 1830, agricultural products have been an important component of railroad business plans. Early rail transportation greatly increased market options for farmers in settled parts of the country and enabled agrarian development of the Great Plains after the Civil War. Though seemingly eclipsed in prominence by coal, oil, and intermodal traffic, grain still represents a substantial share of the rail industry's 21st century traffic mix. Overall, railroads originated about 28% of all U.S. grain shipments in 2011. In 2013, shipments of grain accounted for 4.6% of carloads and 7.1% of revenue tonnage originated by the seven Class 1 railroads at the time, and that's according to the U.S. Association of American Railroad Statistics. Where agricultural traffic shines, though, is in the revenue that it earns. According to the AAR, that 4.6% of loads generates about 6.5% of the carrier's total revenue. Over the past 20 years, as of 2015, short-haul grain shipments up to 500 miles had increasingly shifted to trucks, while the length of haul and therefore the revenue per load of rail shipments had increased dramatically, more than doubling for soybeans. Longer hauls generally earn the railroads more money. Railroads have also succeeded in raising grain rates and collecting surcharges to recover fuel costs when the cost of diesel rises. Rail carriers don't publicly report the profitability of each segment of their traffic portfolios, but it's safe to conclude that none of the big class ones is losing money on its grain business. The BNSF, which hauls more grain than any other railroad, said in February 2014 that agricultural products would continue to be a vibrant growth industry and they were investing and expanding the capacity to support that growth. Some major railroads have expanded their grain franchises by purchasing short rail lines that are supported largely by farm shipments. Perhaps the biggest class one railroad to bet on grain has been the Canadian Pacific's 2008 purchase of the Dakota, Minnesota and Eastern for $1.48 billion. In its successful 2012 campaign to oust CP's incumbent directors, Pershing Square Capital Management argued that the railroad had overpaid for this asset. Nonetheless, after CP installed new leadership, a la Juan E. Hunter Harrison, the company hung on to the eastern portion of the DM&E, which feeds a steady flow of corn, wheat, and ethanol shipments to the rest of the system. The DM&E's sparsely trafficked western part was sold to the Genesee in Wyoming in 2014, and now operates as the Rapid City, Pierre, and Eastern. One reason that railroads are making a success of their grain traffic is that they are hauling it more efficiently. The historic image of a diesel road switcher trundling down a 10 mile per hour branch line with 20 covered hoppers in tow to switch out country elevators is no longer the norm, owing changes driven by competition. A farmer harvesting a crop wants to sell it to the highest bidder. This may be an industrial user, such as a flour mill or a soybean crusher, or a dealer operating a storage facility like a grain elevator. The farmer may sell immediately after harvesting or store some or all of the crop waiting for a better deal. Different grains of the same type and grade are generally fungible, and buyers will seek out the lowest delivered price regardless of who the seller might be. Since transportation is a big part of that price, the cheaper the grain moves to the buyer, the more the buyer can pay the farmer. Railroad costs in turn depend largely on investment. Tracks, cars, and locomotives cost money to buy and to maintain. The more efficient that they're used, the lower the unit cost of handling each load, making the railroad more competitive. However, traditional car load service did not enable railroads to optimize the use of their assets.
Even when moving multiple car shipments in manifest freight trains, railroads were fortunate to load each car once a month because cars had to be switched at every junction and often missed connections. Railroads knew how to wring more productivity out of their equipment, run dedicated unit trains from origin to destination and back again without switching like they did for their coal-consuming electric utility customers. But the average elevator didn't handle enough grain or have enough track space to load train length shipments. Burlington Northern adopted pricing and operating policies during the 1990s to evolve grain transportation toward the unit train model. After buying thousands of new 286,000 pound covered hoppers capable of carrying 110 tons of grain, 10% more than the previous 100 ton standard, Burlington Northern offered customers discounts for shipping train load quantities in the new cars and for loading and releasing empty cars quickly. Running in solid trains that the Burlington Northern called shuttles, the new cars were able to make more turns which combined with the strong export market enabled the BN to post an all-time record for grain volume in August of 1995, a month before the Santa Fe merger. Its successor, the BNSF Railway, continued the shuttle train program, giving its lowest rates to shippers that could load a 110-car train for a single destination in 15 hours. Other railroads follow suit, though conditions such as train length and loading time vary by the carrier. Since the advent of the shuttles, some 300 elevators have invested millions in additional track and grain handling capacity to meet the BNSF's shuttle rate performance requirements and improve their competitive position as grain merchants. Shuttles increase car velocity to as many as three round trips a month between Midwestern origins and the Pacific Northwest destinations and up to eight turns a month on shorter routes enabling railroads to minimize their investment in locomotives and cars while maximizing production. To pay off their investment in increased loading capacity, shuttle loaders must push more grain through their facilities. Typically, they share some of their transportation savings with the farmers by paying them more for the grain. This places non-shuttle elevators at a disadvantage as grain trucks drive right by on their way to shuttle train loadouts. Increasingly, non-shuttle elevators that aren't within trucking distance of ports or end users are going out of business as they're unable to compete. A few states have implemented programs to aid these smaller elevators, with the state of Washington going so far as to buy the 300-mile Palouse River and Cowley City from the Watco in 2007 in order to preserve rail service. Another barrier to increasing productivity was the historic volatility of grain traffic. Poor harvest and low market prices depressed grain shipments, resulting in idle cars and locomotives that weren't earning their keep. Conversely, the railroads could not supply enough cars in times of high demand. To spread some of this risk to its customers, the Burlington Northern initiated its Certificates of Transportation program in 1988. Under this scheme, a shipper can purchase the right to load covered hoppers with a given commodity for a particular destination at a specific future time. If it needs to change, the shipper can sell that right to another customer who needs the capacity and if no one uses the equipment, Burlington Northern earns something to cover its cost to own the unused cars. Grain shippers balked initially, but after Burlington Northern's COTS tariff survived legal challenges, other railroads initiated similar programs and they are now entrenched. What is intermodalism and what does it have to do with the ports? Intermodalism is quite simply a system whereby standard-sized cargo containers are moved seamlessly between different modes of transport. Intermodalism has advanced from the equivalent of the Stone Age to the Space Age in just under 65 years. Commencing with the maiden voyage of the IDLX between the port of Newark, New Jersey and Houston, Texas in 1956 with 58 metal containers through to the call of the MSC Fabiola, one of the largest container vessels now serving the U.S.-Asia trade with a capacity of 12,500 TEUs at the port of Long Beach, intermodalism has come of age. No longer can a shipping company, manufacturer, or retailer think of the ports and other modes of transportation in isolation. The respective modes are interconnected and are an integral part of the global supply chain. Volatile energy prices, congestion at key inland intermodal points such as Chicago, and the need to fill emptied containers returning to port, a process known as matchback, are all part of intermodalism. 
To give you an example of this matchback scenario, there's already lots of grain shipped in containers, but it's a volatile, unpredictable, and opportunistic business. The first defect is that grain is a backhaul movement in an empty container that came from Asia loaded with consumer goods or auto parts or something. The grain can never pay enough for a head haul movement in the container because when its price gets that high, then the bulk ships come out of the copper ore, rubber, bauxite, and iron ore trade and move grain instead. So the business is only feasible as long as there are containers going back empty. Example given, a really booming import economy. The second defect is that loaded containers that come from Asia don't go to places like Huron, Michigan or South Dakota or bigger Saskatchewan to disgorge their loads of auto parts and tennis shoes. They go to the big cities. That creates a major cost hurdle for the backhaul of grain in containers. Either the grain has to go to the city or the port and transload it into the container or the empty container has to go to the grain belt which means a lot of empty miles for the container and an intermodal facility at the grain loading point or the covered hopper loaded with the grain has to go to the big city or the port. <laughs> Are you confused yet? The third defect is the desire to keep the containers turning. The shipping lines which own the international containers do not like to have their containers wandering off into the wilderness because they need to keep them moving to keep their costs down. So most of the people who have tried to set up container restuff facilities any place other than a port or a big city have never gotten their business beyond the business plan stage. The fourth defect is the same problem on the Asian end. The manufacturing is clustered in a very narrow belt along the coasts and around the ports. The ships don't want their containers disappearing into the inland of China or Vietnam either. They might never come back. Plus, they want them reloaded with the profitable head haul consumer goods that same day, if possible. And at the ports, there isn't a lot of consumption of animal feed. The fifth defect is that most of the demand for container-sized lots of grain is in places like Vietnam and the Philippines not in China where the ship lines don't really want to go because there isn't enough of a head haul demand. The big ships that move the trade to the United States don't go to the small ports where there's demand for the containerized grain and a ship to ship transload into the smaller feeder ships is expensive. Overall, the use of containers for grain transportation is a volatile business with nasty external dependencies. It's not a business you'd want today to make a big investment of fixed plant into because tomorrow your empty container supply might evaporate.